The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. Since the Kennedy administration in the early 1960s, the United States National Security Advisor has served as the chief advisor to the president on important issues of national security. The many individuals who have held this office in the past 60 years have used their significant influence to shape defense and foreign policy with varying degrees of success. Joining us to discuss the critical role of national security advisors in U.S. policymaking is Matt Despler, professor at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy and author of In the Shadow of the Oval Office, Profiles of the National Security Advisors and the Presidents They Served, from JFK to George W. Bush. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besharov. Matt Desler. Welcome to Policy Watch and the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Thank you very much, Doug. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm not sure why I actually say welcome to the University of Maryland School of Public Policy since you've been teaching there longer than I, but we'll let that one pass. I'm also a great admirer of your program and happy to be on it. Well, thanks. Um, with another of our colleagues, Ivo Dolder, you have written a wonderful book. It's called In the Shadow of the Oval Office, Profiles of the National Security Advisors and the Presidents They Served, from JFK to George W. Bush. Uh, to our audience, uh, let me say that not only is this an immensely informative book, but it's a lot of fun to read. I just enjoyed it, so congratulations. Great that you enjoyed it, Doug. Yeah. We tried to re write it that way, but we're happy people think we might have succeeded. I mentioned to a friend that you were going to be on this show, and she said, oh, it was such a well-reviewed book. So congratulations. Thank you, Doug. So, Mac, what's a national security advisor? And why did you write this book about them? A national security advisor is the per senior person in the White House who supports the president in a day-to-day -day way on foreign policy and defense issues. Uh, the formal title is Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, Senior Member of the White House Staff, etc. This person has been known pretty much from his, Henry Kissinger's time forward as the President's National Security Advisor. But that doesn't seem to really kind of capture, I know it changes by National Security Advisor, but as I understand it, the National Security Advisor is the first senior staff person to see the President? Typically, typically, he's the first one to see the president. He gives the national security intelligence briefing what is that? to the president. What is that? That brings to the president up-to-date information gathered overnight about what's been going on in the world. The president needs to know particularly crisis areas. For Obama, it would presumably involve Iran, Afghanistan, maybe something about Russia, maybe something about China, but the, basically the, the trouble spots around the world. Now, the first National Security Advisor by title was under John Kennedy, but we had the stirrings, right, a little bit under Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Hopkins, and so forth. Well, you had under Franklin Roosevelt, you had a situation where Roosevelt had a Secretary of State who he'd chosen for political reasons, and he increasingly ignored him, particularly when he got into World War II. And instead, he had a longtime friend named Harry Hopkins, who actually lived in the White House and was resident in the White House. This is being, what, what did you write about propinquity? Propinquity, yes. Uh, one famous uh, official, George Ball, said, nothing propinks like propinquity. And this is the And this was the ultimate yes. propinquity. And Harry Hopkins, who had no job whatsoever, didn't have a presidential appointment at this point, I guess, didn't draw a salary, was in fact the most influential presidential advisor and negotiator during the critical years of World War II. And this drove the bureaucracy crazy. This drove the cabinet people crazy. What kinds of things did he do? Well, he would fly off to England and have private conversations with Winston Churchill, for example. And he would, you know, he would t take messages. He would, and he would take messages back from Winston Churchill to Franklin Roosevelt. And these would, of course, be kept close and not shared. And of course, this is on top of, or in addition to, 
the private conversations between Roosevelt and Churchill. That's right. That's correct. Um, yes. Where was the State Department rule list, and did it matter? Well, the State Department was headed by a veteran senator from t uh, Tennessee, known Cordell Hull, who was uh, too important and too well connected for the president to fire but who didn't get along with Roosevelt, wasn't on the same wavelengths with him. And so, uh, and the president of the State Department at that time had kind of an old line bureaucracy and it hadn't been that supportive of Roosevelt. It changed actually a lot after World War II, but at that time. So Roosevelt was not surprisingly, wanted other advice, he wanted other support. And this was ad hoc uh, and it wasn't until Kennedy that you institutionalized this job in the sense that the pre this national security advisor becomes regularly the person in the White House who handles national security foreign well, policy. Well, let's back up for a second, yeah. though, because I think you're getting ahead of my story. Okay. Uh, I'm struck by something that you just said because it's a theme in the book that I, um, I noticed, which is, Many times the president's not happy with his State Department or his Secretary of State. And so the, this new post of National Security Advisor looks to be an alternate means for the president to do what he needs to do. If the president isn't happy with his Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor job is an alternate means. And sometimes, like under Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger becomes, for all intents and purposes, the Secretary of State. In a sense, he does all the important diplomacy. He does all the important policy advice to the president. There are other occasions, like under George Bush the father, where the National Security Advisor, Brent Scowcroft, works very well with the Secretary of State, James Baker, who is a close presidential friend. So you get a lot of different patterns here, but it certainly is a, an alternative to the Secretary of State, and so the person in that job is a potential and often actual threat to the Secretary of State. So it's a fluid job, depending on the situation, the President's personality, the situation at the State Department, and I take it also what's on the front burner, whether it's a recession or a war. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the first person who actually had the title was? Well, actually, the first person who had, actually had the title was an Eisenhower official mm -hmm, mm -hmm. named Bobby Cutler. Eisenhower decided that this new National Security Council, which had been created under Truman with a professional career staff uh, supporting essentially interagency planning, Eisenhower decided this ought to be systematized and there ought to be a presidential assistant heading it. So he asked Bobby Cutler to organize an elaborate planning system so that they would have policy papers prepared for National Security Council meetings on every conceivable subject that the United States now, might face. Why does this sound a little bit like military planning? Well, one reason might be that Eisenhower was general and uh, commanding general in World War II and that his organizational training was in the military. And Eisenhower was, in fact, probably our most organization-minded of presidents, probably since George Washington, maybe even including George Washington. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, was Cutler an actual national security advisor, or does the Post take on its character under uh, Kennedy? The Post, uh, but Cutler had the title. In fact, Eisenhower administration invented the title. But Cutler did not do what every other national security advisor has done. That's handling the president's day-to-day, -day, current, urgent foreign policy business. It may well be, and Eisenhower really knew this too, that you want to engage in planning. But the decisions, the hot decisions, come in the context of crises. They come in the context of things that hit the president's desk that have to be dealt with. People have to be pulled together on short notice to argue it out to advise the president. And that's what uh, Bundy did for John F. Kennedy, Bundy, McGeorge Bundy being the first person to hold what we call the modern job of national security advisor. Well, in a minute, I'm going to ask you, you know, the bestest and the worstest, but let's stay with um, uh, Bundy for a second. Uh, what were the key decisions that he made that shaped the job in ways that you could still recognize today? Well, the first thing Bundy did was he realized that what his job is, is to serve the president and to connect him to the rest of the government. So, in a sense, what Kennedy wanted, Bundy had to want. Mm -hmm. And what Kennedy's style was, Bundy's style had to be. Now, it was easy, actually, because the two were very compatible. And so it worked pretty well. But one thing that uh, Kennedy clearly wanted was he wanted access to the hot stuff. 
He wanted the cables. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. wanted what was going on today, tomorrow, what was being said to the ambassador in Vietnam or in Russia or whatever. And so Bundy, uh, who didn't, of course, know much about the system by which cables were transmitted, uh, got the only guy on his staff who did and said, Bromley, you're going to do it. You're going to mm -hmm. pull together a system where we can actually hear the cable, read the cables, have them sent in duplicate into the White House basement. So this is listening in on what people are telling the Secretary of State. Yeah, I mean, it's reading in, in a sense. Yeah, it's yeah, documents, yeah. Uh, but it's documents, it's getting copies of documents in a very old-fashioned uh, technology, and they use pneumatic tubes to shoot them from the uh, room in the White House basement where they were, uh, you know, came in to the uh, offices where they were then sorted and uh, very much teletype type machines. But it was, but they got the current stuff. The president wanted it. And this, of course, worried people out in the State Department because they said, oh my God, the president's gonna get stuff before we do, he's gonna embarrass us. So they try to deal with that. They get the, uh, they, get the uh, to, they tell the Secretary of State staff, we're showing this to the president, you better be sure that Dean Rusk, who was Kennedy's Secretary of State, better be sure that Dean sees it too. So when Kennedy calls, he'll know about it. But still, it was, gave the president a real one-up on them. Uh, and I was struck in the book because it didn't sound as if, it didn't seem as if Bundy wanted to be the only one briefing the president. In fact, he encouraged his staff uh, to have one-on-ones with the president without him. Now, that's different from how the national security advisor now operates, right? This is well, a little bit a, more... Bunny was unusual in the degree to which he wanted other members of his staff to uh, deal with things. For example, there was a war in an obscure part of the Middle East called Yemen. Mm -hmm. There was a guy on the staff named Bob Comer. And Kennedy said to, uh, and, and Kennedy kept asking me, George Bundy, about Yemen. Tell me about Yemen. And, Ken, and Bundy said, don't ask me, ask Comer. And Kennedy would keep saying, who's Comer? Who's Comer? Well, finally, in a sort of an interesting incident, which we describe in the book, Kennedy ends up seeing uh, Comer in action and is impressed. So Comer then becomes somebody that Kennedy, and Bundy's happy about this. Bundy wants to do Europe. He wants to do Russia. He doesn't want to do, he doesn't really want to do Vietnam, but he gets pulled into it. This is unusual. Yeah. Now let's let, let's go back. Let's let, let's look at the whole uh, line of uh, advisors since right. then. And you have one advisor who you hold out as the model. Right. That is. That advisor is Brent Scowcroft. He's the only person who was kind of appointed to the job twice. He became national security advisor first under Gerald Ford in the 1970s, and then in the late 1980s, George H.W. Bush, the father, appointed him national security advisor in his administration. And why is he, in your mind, the model of a, of a good national security advisor? Well, first of all, and it was indispensable, he was very close to his presidents. He was very trusted by them. He was straight with them. He gave them information. Uh, he was, became so close to Bush that they ended up writing a joint memoir. Nobody's ever done that before or since. Uh, secondly, however, he saw his job as making the process work. Uh, that meant bringing in the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, bringing in the deputies, this making several levels of government, speaking to each other, working together, deciding what to do, what issues need to be pushed up to the top, what issues can be handled lower down. And he was a model himself of being honest, being fair, representing everybody's views, and this was contagious, so people below him played that role too. Well, if that's the model for the best, Right. The worst. The worst is almost certainly John Poindexter, who was Ronald Reagan's fourth national security advisor and was complicit in what became known as the Iran-Contra scandal, where Oliver North on the National Security Council staff ran wild, conducted secret negotiations to sell arms to Iran, which was directly against U.S. official policy, and then used the proceeds to fund aid to the revolutionaries in Nicaragua, which was against a direct congressional statute. And this was all done uh, secretly. When it was revealed, it brought down Ronald Reagan's presidency to a very low ebb. Um, you know, I was struck in your descriptions of Bundy and Scowcroft. It seemed to me that there are some conditions besides personalities that make for a successful national security advisor. Is that a fair question? Well, one thing is 
the president they serve. One friend of ours who read the manuscript said, there's one lesson here. Choose your president wisely mm -hmm. if you're a national security advisor. Uh, I mean, meaning? Meaning, would a, uh, would a Scowcroft have done as well with a Nixon? Or would he have done as well with a Lyndon Johnson, who were much more difficult presidents to support, who had much greater idiosyncrasies in terms of their personalities? George H.W. Bush was a pretty straightforward guy. He was demanding, but he was straight about his demands and easy to service. And also, my impression is that it's not as if Scowcroft could have, Scowcroft could have gone too far in the other direction because Bush had a strong, a good friend at the State Department. Absolutely. And under Ford, uh, there was a pretty strong Secretary of State as well. One named Henry Kissinger. Yes. yes. So that helps define this a little bit as well. That's true. It? That's true. Yeah. yeah. And so it's not just the president and the assistant. It's also who the cast of senior characters is. So probably one of the most famous national security advisors, of course, is Henry Kissinger. Absolutely. Probably the most famous, yes. I think. Uh, at least in Hollywood. In Hollywood, but I think probably he was the only national security advisor ever to be named in polls the most admired man in America. Is that right? Yeah, that's yes, right. right. And he, uh, and and he was he was in by any measure. If you look at uh, being reported in the newspapers, he was reported more. His name was in the papers more as national security advisor than anybody else before or since. His accomplishments. Well, Kissinger was very central to what was, I think, historically by far the most important thing Richard Nixon did, which was to open up relations between the United States and the People's Republic of China, which had basically been shut down since the Chinese Revolution in 1949 until Nixon came to power in 1969. Now, you have to give the president credit here. There's some danger, particularly with Kissinger, to think that Kissinger did everything mm -hmm. and that Nixon, we were, all that Nixon did was appoint him. Now, in fact, Nixon himself was very very serious policy person, and he was the one before Kissinger who saw a possibility and necessity of developing a relationship with China. But Kissinger became his instrument, and Kissinger uh, was the person who flew secretly to Beijing in the summer of 1971 and negotiated with Zhou Enlai and came back so that Nixon could stun the world with this announcement. So Kissinger did carry it out, and he was uh, very effective in carrying uh, it out. And, and you mentioned flew um, to China secretly, and I always wondered, uh, could a Secretary of State had, have done that? Because he actually was secret. It wasn't there some, some cover story he was in Paris He was or something? tearing around the world, and he went to Pakistan, mm -hmm. and then he got the flu, <laughs> in quotes. And for two days, he was disabled with the flu, and nobody could see him. And it just happened, of course, that he was getting on an airplane and flying to... Uh, one of the interesting stories was there were three types of people on Kissinger's airplane as he crew, flew across the world. There was a small group of people who were going to go with him to Beijing. There was a slightly larger group who knew he was going to Beijing, and the rest of them, most of them, who didn't know he was going to Beijing. Uh -huh. And Winston Lord, who staffed the president on this, had to get three separate briefing books, and be, and which were constantly being revised at Kissinger's demand, and he had to constantly redo them and be sure that the right person got the right one, so that they kept, uh, so that nobody would know who shouldn't know that Henry was actually going to Beijing. And the Secretary of State didn't know either. And Kissinger and the Russians. Kissinger and the Russians. Uh, Kissinger and Nixon both felt that the Soviet Union. We needed to have a structured relation with the Soviet Union. The word in those days was detente? Well, they, the word became detente, which was a rela meant a relaxation of tensions. But they thought it ought to be real. They thought it ought to involve concessions on both sides on uh, strategic arms. They thought it ought to involve economic relations. They thought it involved a range of issues. And so they sought to negotiate a comprehensive framework of deals with the Soviet Union. And they did complete the first comprehensive arms control treaties and agreements with Russia that uh, had been uh, achieved. And this was an important achievement. Let's fast forward a little bit uh, to George W. Bush and his national security advisor, his first one, Condoleezza Rice. Right. Um, 
it seems fair to me to say she gets mixed grades for her you know, performance. Mixed is be a, the, a polite way of describing the grades she generally gets for the job. There's a general feeling that she wasn't effective in forcing debate within the government on the key issues and making sure the president got the full range of possible opinions, the full range of analysis. Now, this was not entirely her fault. In fact, you could say it was more the president's fault, perhaps. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let's go back to the, those days, So, because you talked about how uh, Scowcroft may have been blessed with his secretary of right. state and, and, and people getting along. But if I remember correctly, uh, there were people uh, at the secretary of the cabinet level in the Bush administration who hardly talked to each other. Colin Powell is fighting with Rumsfeld. There's right. Cheney with Rumsfeld. And right. then on the side is Scooter Libby, who we'll get to in a second. That's right. The president, uh, the, Colin Powell was one of the most respected men in America, but he didn't have the president's confidence in the sense that ultimately the president didn't think Powell was really working for him. And therefore, Powell was not uh, as nearly as important a figure in the Bush administration as people thought he should be. Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld was very important. Vice President Dick Cheney was enormously important, particularly in the first term. And Rumsfeld and Cheney together uh, made it very hard for Rice to do her job because in different ways they went around her. They didn't respect her prerogatives. Uh, one time at a National Security Council meeting, uh, Rumsfeld handed out a briefing book, and at the end of the meeting, he just walked up to Rice and took it away from her. He says, we're taking that back to the Pentagon. Uh, where's Scooter Liddy in all this? Scooter Libby was uh, Dick Cheney's chief of his foreign policy staff. And Libby essentially, Liddy essentially had an, a rival or an alternative foreign policy staff to the much larger, more established National Security Staff. By the way, how staff. large is this National Security Staff by, by this time? By this time, the National Security Staff is probably uh, 60, 70, 80 people, probably 60 or 70 at this point, maybe. And Libby, Liddy has maybe 10, 12 or so people. But they're more fluid, and of course, they don't have to manage the policy process. They staff the sector, they staff the vice president, and they arm him for debate, and uh, they're very effective. They're very smart. So people thought there were times when they thought that maybe Liddy had more influence than Condoleezza Rice, even though she had a close relationship with President Bush. Watched football games with him and so forth. She watched forth. football games with him. She, uh, she briefed him. She was very much his tutor on foreign policy. But he didn't, he didn't want in-depth analysis, and he didn't want long, ongoing debates in front of him on a range of issues. And these things are what partly makes the power of the National Security Advisor, because if there are debates, they have to be organized, papers have to be prepared, you have to figure out who's going to argue which side. Uh, Brzezinski wrote and said since he was President Carter's National Security Advisor that the fact that Carter wanted to be deeply engaged in foreign policy clearly empowered him because he had to be the manager of those debates and had to bring issues together. Similarly, George H.W. Bush wanted to be the manager of policy that empowered uh, Mr. Uh, Scowcroft, Rent Scowcroft, Kennedy and Bundy, similar. We're, we're, we're talking in a, a little bit about, um, I, I mentioned about, uh, Rice and George W. Bush watching uh, football together. Uh, but there are some famous or infamous examples of private interactions between presidents and their secretaries of state. Well, I suppose the most uh, ultimately almost absurd one was when uh, Nixon was about to resign from office. He was trying to come to terms with himself, with history. He was probably drunk uh, or, or on medication of some sort. And in any case, he says to Kissinger, come pray with me, Henry. Pray with me, Henry. Let's pray for the future of myself, for the future of our work, and all this thing. So Henry Kissinger gets down on his knees, this, uh, this uh, Jewish refugee from Germany and this Quaker. Uh, they get down on their knees and they pray together. And, uh, Nixon is apparently somewhat mollified, somewhat uh, pacified, if you could say that about a Quaker. Now, this being Washington, one has to ask the following question. There were only two people in that room. Yes. How did that story get out? I think it probably didn't get out from 
from Nixon. No, I think that's probably right. I think we we can assume that it, it got out essentially through Woodward and through the, uh, the final days book that Bob Woodward wrote, uh, you know, the reporter who broke the Watergate story, and then wrote a book called The, the Final Days, and that was uh, the uh, how it got out. And one of the things that different national security advisors have handled very differently was the press. Mm -hmm. And Henry Kissinger was very good at dealing with the press. In his first term, almost never on the record, because Nixon didn't want him on the record. National security advisors weren't supposed to be on the record at that time. But he got the message that he wanted in the paper. Yeah, yeah. and then it went from there. This has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, we're going to continue this with a discussion about the presidents and how they affect the role of the National Security Advisor. But for now, Mac Dessler, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, to our viewing audience, thank you for watching us. This is Policy Watch. If you have any questions or comments, please write to us at policywatch at UMD. That's UMD for University of Maryland edu. Until next time, this is Doug Besheroff saying thanks again. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS.